I would now like to call upon our first speaker, Dr. Julian Rayner. Dr. Julian Rayner is Senior Group Leader and Director of Welcome Genome Campus Connecting Science. His research group works on human-parasite interactions in malaria. Julian has a number of research collaborations across Africa, including the West African Malaria Invasion Network and the Kemri Welcome Trust Research Institute in Kilifi. Julian has worked closely with Cambridge Africa for a number of years and is mentoring African PhD and postdoc fellows. He will talk to us about the importance of sharing resources, capacity, and training. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you also for the coveted after lunch slot where uh, everyone is their most alert and uh, switched in, especially given the amount of coffee that you all haven't drunk. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak briefly about some of our most recent research work uh, and, and share some data that's, that's not published, but do that in the context of why it's so important to do this kind of work in collaboration and in close uh, partnership with African scientists. This is the problem that I work on, which is how malaria parasites get inside red blood cells. So uh, malaria parasites have this fiendishly complex life cycle, uh, which is not really that complex, but even, even the 30 seconds to explain it is more time than I can give it. But I'm interested in this stage right here, which is when the parasites are invading our red blood cells, chewing up all the hemoglobin inside them to use as a source of food, multiplying, and then blowing up our red blood cells to invade new red blood cells. And that cycle goes on and on and on in our blood, um, causing anemia, causing pulmonary com complications, causing lots of other severe uh, complications. And I work in malaria for many reasons, but, but one of the main reasons is this right here, which is this is the process of malaria invading red blood cell. Here's a malaria parasite. It's quite a small cell. It's only about one micron long. It makes contact with the red cell out on its surface. Then it makes it what's called a tight junction, an electron-dense junction. And that junction then gets split and pulled around the parasite and drives the parasite inwards into the red blood cell. And that process is just, I think, fascinating. How does one eukaryotic cell get inside another eukaryotic cell? And what's more, just not, not just any eukaryotic cell, but is, are there any hematologists in the audience? What, okay, then I can say this joke. Essentially gets inside what is basically just a bag of hemoglobin. It's not a real cell at all. So the parasite has a huge amount of work to do, and it does it incredibly rapidly and uh, quite remarkably. So this is a, a video uh, that will not play. Well, we'll have to see it later on. But essentially, the parasite... Uh, deforms the red blood cell, shifts it around. It's really quite a, a, an aggressive and remarkable process, but it all happens when, within 30 or 45 seconds because the parasite's just trying to get into the red blood cell before the immune system detects it. So that whole process is all built on interactions between proteins on the surface of the parasite and proteins on the surface of the red blood cell. And work by a number of labs over a number of years identified a number of parasite proteins that have you know, fiendish acronyms which really don't matter. But the problem that we had in the field for a long time is we had no idea what they were recognizing on the red blood cell surface. And there are technical reasons for that. These are quite hard things to isolate these kinds of protein-protein interactions. But it's absolutely crucial because this process is obviously quite an interesting vaccine target. The parasite is usually inside a host cell. But for this brief period of time, it's outside the host cell trying to get in. So if you knew what interactions were going on, then you could define the ones that were important and try and block them. So uncovering this um, complexity of what's binding to what was very important. And at the Sanger, um, over a number of years, we've been looking for new interactions. This is old data. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. But a little while ago, we took this parasite protein called RH5 that we thought was quite interested interesting and tested whether it bound to a number of different red blood cell proteins and found that it bound to one of these, this protein called basogen, which I'd never heard of until we'd done the screen, which is the wonderful thing about screening. You, you find stuff that you have no idea exists. The exciting thing about this interaction is if we tried to block this interaction, we totally blocked invasion. So here's a, an assay where we're increasing the amount of antibody against the red blood cell protein, basogen, and we're monitoring the ability of the parasite to invade red blood cells. And as the concentration of the antibody goes up, 
the invasion efficiency goes down. And this was true. This is one of the most exciting graphs that people in my lab have ever shown me. Um, and the reason it's so exciting is because no matter what strain we tried, no matter what condition we tried, it always worked the same. So this interaction seems to be fundamentally important for red blood cell invasion. And RH5 is now a major vaccine target. There are phase 2A vaccine studies going on right now at the Jenner Institute in Oxford, led by the amazing Simon Draper. So that's all, that's all past work. But the question that I've been, has just been niggling at the back of my mind for several years is, is this actually what happens during invasion? So we think we've uncovered a fundamental mechanism. Is this actually what happens during invasion? And it's a not very well kept secret that the system that we work on in our labs when we work on malaria parasites is not really exactly what happens out in the real world. For one thing, this is where the parasite that all of those assays came from was done on. So it's from the, the well-known malaria endemic region um, of the Netherlands. It's a remarkable story, but the parasite that's used as the sort of the, the normal lab strain was isolated from someone who lived near Schiphol Airport in the Netherlands, had never traveled outside the Netherlands, and presumably contracted malaria from a mosquito that came back on a plane um, from West Africa. We know it's from West Africa because we've got the genome of this parasite now, so we know where it is. So this is where the parasite that we work with every day in our lab comes from, but is that really representative of the huge diversity of parasites that are out there in the field? And my colleague, uh, Dominic Kwiatkowski, in the, in the Sanger Malaria Program, they've been sequencing malaria parasites from all around the world in this extraordinary program called MalariaGen, and there's just an enormous amount of genetic diversity within these parasites. So is my little parasite isolated outside of the, the airport in the Netherlands representative of this diversity? And then, of course, we grow the parasites in our lab. You know, we have people in the hoods all day growing parasites, feeding them blood, and we get this beautiful blood from the NHS blood transplant unit, and, uh, you know, we, we use rather large amounts of it because there are quite a lot of people growing, transport, uh, growing uh, parasites. But, of course, that blood comes from random donors in the UK, and is that blood representative of actually the red blood cells that the parasites are invading? And of course, in Africa, there's a huge amount of genomic variation amongst people in Africa. And we know that that can affect red blood cells. So this is the most famous example, of course, the sickle cell um, uh, uh, allele, which is at different distributions around different parts of Africa and has an impact on how the parasite grows. So how do we make the study of invasion and how do we make the study of blood cell vaccine targets actually representative of the malaria that we're trying to control? And the answer is we try and do that through partnership with African scientists supported by Cambridge Africa and other organizations. So for example, parasite diversity, we've known for some years that different parasite strains use different pathways to invade red blood cells. There's no one way in. Different parasite strains use different pathways. And over the last 20 years, there have been a bunch of studies of people all around the world testing this and finding it's true that there are different pathways. But the problem is, all of these studies use different methodologies and different approaches, and actually comparing the data is, is basically impossible. So here's an essay we developed in our lab where we take red blood cells from different people, label them with different fluorescent dyes, and then throw them into the well of a 96-well plate and add parasites. And by flow cytometry, you can tell which of those red blood cells the parasite winds up in. We call this the erythrocyte preference essay. Um, and that's one thing we use, but of course many other labs use different approaches. So how do you try and standardize that? Well, with support from Cambridge Africa a few years ago, we ran a course in, in the beautiful Dakar, um, Senegal, where, where several people in this audience were along with me a couple of weeks ago at the, um, multi the, the MIM malaria conference. We were in Dakar a few years earlier um, running a course on invasion phenotyping and getting the, the leaders in West Africa and in the UK together to try and standardize the assays and standardize the approach. And you can see uh, there Gordon Awandari, Professor Awandari, who, who spoke just earlier. And over the course of, uh, as I find frequently when I'm visiting Professor Awandari, over the course of grilled fish and beer, we came up with uh, plans for world domination. And... Uh, 
uh, created something called the West Africa Malaria Invasion Network, which is essentially a network of scientists across West Africa and now extend, extend, expanding, trying to use the same methodologies and the same approach to understand how invasion uh, varies between different parasite strains and how we can overcome that in vaccine design. So we now have co-supervised graduate students and postdocs, some of them supported through the CAPRIC system. Um, we've got uh, equipment that's been supported by the Alvarado Trust, and we're now trying to address this in a systematic way. The other thing I want to tell you about is, is work that's happening right now in Kenya um, and led by two postdocs, one, Sylvia Karayuki, who's supported by one of the Delta schemes, and is, is, um, this is a joint project with myself and Tom Williams in, in Kenya uh, at the Kemri uh, Welcome Unit in Kalifi, and Ale Alejandro Marin Merendez, who's a postdoc in my lab. And what they're trying to address is the other side of the question, not parasite diversity, but human diversity. So it's well known that different humans have different susceptibility to severe malaria. And sickle is obviously the most well-known example. But there have now been large genome-wide association studies to try and identify new variants that are associated with protection. And one that was published just last year is this uh, antigen called the Dantu antigen. And this is just showing a plot. This is a scan across the human genome. You've essentially got um, risk of severe malaria here, and you can see a cluster of, of SNPs, of variants that are associated with very, very significantly decreased risk of severe malaria. That, that cluster of SNPs is around a locus of three genes in the human genome, the glycophorin cluster, glycophorin A, B, and E, that are right next to each other, head to tail, in the cluster. And in people with this variant, they have a very strange re reorganization of the genes in this cluster. So instead of having three genes right next to each other, they have two copies of one of the genes, and then the others have been uh, forced together in this chimeric way, that you have a completely new gene formed, and this is what forms the Dantu antigen. So this is associated with really quite striking protection against severe malaria. If you're homozygous for this, your chances of getting um, severe falciparum malaria is reduced by 70%, which is almost as much as sickle. It's quite a rare variant, and it's really only found in a small region of East Africa. But why? Why is this, this variant, why is this structural rearrangement in the, in the human genome causing protection against severe malaria? So what Alejandro and Silvia are doing in this quite remarkable study where, um, with amazing support from the team in Kalifi, they're going out into the community finding people with these rare variants, bringing, uh, asking them to consent to be part of the study, taking some red blood cells and bringing them back into the lab in Kalifi and also shipping some back here and doing, doing these amazing array of assays to try and understand what's going on. And the first assay that they did was just testing the ability of parasites to invade those Dantu red blood cells. So what you have here is um, red blood cells from people who have essentially wild type at this locus. People who are heterozygous have one copy of the Dantu um, variant and, and one normal. And then people who are homozygous have both copies of the Dantu. And these are five different strains from different parts of the world. And you could see very convincingly that the parasites do not like to invade these um, unusual red blood cells. You see a clear dose-dependent reduction in invasion, um, regardless of which strain you use, which was a total surprise to us. They've gone on to then, uh, here in the, in the Cavendish Laboratory, um, look at those uh, invasion events under video microscopy. So here are malaria parasites trying to invade red blood cells, and you can see them uh, making contact with the surface. They, they shift the, the red blood cell as well around. They make these kind of, um, they, they deform the surface and they go in. If you, look at the, if, if you look at the same process instead of now with wild type cells, if you look at cells for, with this rare variant, you see the parasites come out of the infected red blood cell. They make contact with the surface. They do the same kind of deformation. They shift the, the red cell around. They're doing everything they can to get in, but they just don't find their way into the red blood cell. And we've quantified that, and both the rate at which they invade and the speed at which they invade is severely reduced. We've also been characterizing the red blood cells themselves. There are various changes on the surface of the red blood cells. So this is a bunch of different markers that are on the surface of the red blood cell. Some of them are unchanged, but some of them in these Dantu uh, homozygous cells are severely reduced. And the cells themselves are actually changed. They're smaller, 
Um, the Dantu cells are smaller than regular red blood cells, and they're much more rigid. They don't bend, um, and they, they're, they're much more tense. And so our current working model, this is, this is literally the first time anyone has seen this data. Um, our current working model is that what's happening is the, this Dantu variant is essentially decreasing the bending modulus, increasing the tension of the red blood cell membrane, and making it much harder for the parasites to invade. I tell you this, this story both because it's super exciting science, but also it's a wonderful example of the kind of collaboration you need to, to, um, uh, to make data like this happen. So this is a collaboration between myself and Tom Williams, Dominic Kwiatowski and his team in Oxford, Here's Alex and Sylvia, the lab team in Khalifi, the team at the biophysics department, um, Pietro Chikuta, and it takes people flying back and forward from Kenya, samples flying back and forward from Kenya, training in all directions to make this kind of science happen. And it's an it's enormous privilege to be involved within it. So very final, the, the last couple of slides, I want to um, tell you why I think this kind of work is so important. So remember, what these guys are doing is they're going out into the community, trying to track down people with very rare uh, red blood cells variant who I'm sure don't even know that they have it. There's no, F, no um, suggestion that this has any impact on health. Trying to convince them to be part of the study, um, which you, know, you then have to explain what the study is and what it means. And this involves a huge amount of engagement between the scientists and the healthcare professionals and members of the public and community. And I, I happen to be particularly passionate about this. I work in an institute, the Sanger Institute, which is at a point in time which is quite interesting to observe. So genomics, as we all know, is, is coming like a freight train, whether we want it or not. And the fact that everyone in the, this country and everyone in the world eventually is likely to have their own genome sequenced and have that as part of their healthcare record that's likely to happen. And the questions that raises about what the opportunities are, what the risks are, but also about the understanding, understanding for members of the public, the healthcare professionals, there's a huge amount of work to be done. So I'm, I'm as well as running my research lab, I'm in charge of a program called Connecting Science, and that's our aim to enable everyone to explore genomics and its impact on research, health, and society. And there are a couple of things that we do which I thought would be useful just to talk about briefly in this context. The first is, the amazing uh, advanced courses team, which is part of Connecting Science, runs near, um, nearly 50 events every year, training and shed, uh, you know, um, sharing the knowledge about genomics and bioinformatics. But we run a number of hands-on practical uh, training courses, a week long or a two week long. Many of those are at the Sanger Institute in our own labs, but we also have increasingly taken those on the road specifically to low and middle income countries. So Gordon mentioned one of those ones earlier this afternoon. We ran our course on malaria experimental genetics in Ghana. Um, the, the team is just back from Bangkok, actually. Alice Matimba, who's here in the audience, who uh, um, um, leads that team with exceptional pride and effort, is just back from Bangkok running the same course there. And all of this is possible through the generous support of the Wellcome Trust, where we can really get these techniques out and share them as rapidly and as widely as we can. The other thing I want to mention is uh, the, the importance of engaging the public with science. So I'm, I passionately believe this is a fundamental part of the academic project. That, that academic science is not just about people in rooms like this talking to each other about the amazing science that we do. It's also us talking to the people who the science is about and the people who the sciences affect. And there's lots of definitions about what engagement is. What it is to me is basically me and people in my team talking with members of the public and listening to them. It's a two-way process of dialogue and sharing information. And you can do that in a number of different ways and in a number of different formats, and the amount of creativity in this area is enormous. So just to take one example, if any of you have, in, have not heard of this program called I'm a Scientist, Get Me Out of Here, I hugely encourage you to take part in it. It's a program where school groups are hooked together with groups of scientists, and for two weeks you essentially dial into their classroom on your computer and you answer questions that they fire at you for half an hour. It's extraordinary. It goes on for two weeks. After the first week, the students start voting the scientists off um, until there's only one scientist remaining. And it's, it's, you know, it, sounds, it sounds a funny thing, but actually, for the students, it's brilliant because it gives them the power. 
right? They're, they've, got, they've got agency. They're not just listening. They're challenging you, and then they have decision-making power of whether, whether you live or die. So it's an, amazing, it's an amazing project. In the context of um, our work in Connecting Science, this is an example just from a few weeks ago. This is Maria Duquez um, in, the, in the Matt Berryman's parasite team who works on human whipworm and ran a project in Colombia um, essentially looking uh, for samples, but at the same time engaging with the school children's. We designed a comic for her to take with her to explain her science to the students. We had a whole lot of uh, activities for them to take part in, and it was extraordinarily successful. I love the look on that, that child's face as he gets his fingers pricked. And I, I'll, I'll finish with this project, which is one of the ones I'm most proud of. This is a project called Genome Decoders. Um, and this is where we're actually getting uh, A-level science students to annotate the genome of the human whipworm. So the human whipworm genome was just sequenced. It's a dirty secret amongst genomics uh, people that most genomes are not manually annotated anymore because there are just too many, too, many, too many genomes, too many genes. And so they get put through various very good computer programs. But for more distant organisms like parasites, it's not always so easy for the computer program to tell what's a gene and what's not a gene. And so we thought, well, why don't we ask, uh, see if we can get A-level students to do it. We worked with a, a team called the Institute for Research in Schools, and we've now got more than 1,000 students around the country. We had to close the program. We've got more than 1,000 A-level students annotating the human whipworm genome. So in summary, um, working, collaborating with scientists and publics, I think, is a fundamental part of what we do. And in my lab, this is my connecting science team, and, and in my research team, the role of organizations and, and uh, initiatives like Cambridge Africa and facilitating those contacts has been absolutely revolutionary. And obviously, the fundamental work that we do is all supported by the Wellcome Trust. Thank you very much for your attention. Julian, for that very engaging and informative presentation on a wide range of collaborations with different facets to it. Would now like to invite questions from the floor. I think there's a roving microphone over here. Uh, I'm Claire Stone. Uh, I'm from PLOS Medicine. Um, I, I was also previously the editor of Genome Biology. So you made a statement that uh, everyone will have their genome sequenced. So I just wanted to ask about whether that's in reality going to happen. When one considers that TB considers more people, c kills more people than HIV and malaria put together for want of a $20 antibiotic prescription, genome sequencing is never going to drop that low, is it? And even if it does, what, is, um, it, what can be implemented with that genomic information so for it's, all? It's a fantastic question, and thank you for pulling me up on my deliberate provocation. Um, so I think it will drop that low. I think that's the first answer. I mean, it, now it's about $1,000 a human genome. I, I think it will go down to the 10s and 20s in the next 10 years. Will everyone have their own genome sequence? I don't know. I think in the UK, the answer is possibly yes. I think in other countries with different healthcare systems, the answer is possibly no. Um, is it good value for money? That's a question that I'm not the best person to ask. I'm not a healthcare economist. But I would say that one facet of genomic information is that it's lifelong. So one of the rationales is that um, over time, our ability to interpret genomics and, and get predictions and associations out of it will increase. And so an investment uh, in a young child in genomics over the course of their life might reap huge cost savings. Whether it's, and I would think those cost savings would outweigh the cost of, of um, the actual sequencing. Whether any, any of that is worth more than the TB medication or the malaria medication that there's not enough of in the world um, and that we need more funding for, I would be absolutely on your side and agree that that's where the money should be spent. But uh, if together we can knock down the, the doors of government and convince them of that, I'd be very happy to join that crusade. Um, there's one question over here, then uh, the one the lady in green. 
my name is Steven, I'm a student here. So in the interest of uh, engaging with the public, as a member of the public, if I ask you that uh, you're trying to find out, like you're almost proving that uh, the DAN2 gene has, is resistant to malaria. Mm. So if you find that out, then what? Are you going, is it going to translate into medicine? Are you going to, to induce anything so that to become malaria resistance? So um, I think there are two parts to that, two answers to that question. The first, what does understanding the, the how Dantu protects against malaria tell us? Well, I think going back to the start, what I probably inelegantly um, said was that understanding this process helps guide our vaccine uh, development. So we went into this project thinking that the Dantu variant, because it's so localized to East Africa, is really not found very many other places. Um, might only protect against East African variants of Plasmodium falciparum. That's one hypothesis we had. That's absolutely not true. And if we understand what it is about the red blood cells that makes them um, so resistant to invasion, then maybe that helps us guide where we need to target any blood stage vaccine. So that's what it was needed for. The question of why engage with people and, and what they will get out of it, I think I, we should talk about that over coffee. But one thing I passionately think is that the benefit is not just for the public, it's also for the scientists. So I think a lot of us uh, labs, a lot of labs work in a sort of bubble distant from the people that actually uh, you know, are afflicted with the conditions we work on. And breaking down those barriers has amazing impact on the scientists as well as on the public. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. It's been really stimulating. Um, my name's Sara Basamela and um, I'm here as a member of the public. Um, I work for a Prudential in financial policy, um, but I'm not representing them. Um, I just wanted to ask about the parasite, not red blood cells. Um, if we cannot get rid of um, par the parasite of mosquitoes, is there something we can invade mosquitoes with so that when they infect a human being, um, when they're sort of reproducing, there's something that's assisting, they're producing an agent that's assisting the immune system to fight malaria? So I, I, I will answer your question in a slightly different way. The, the question of, of how the parasite is transmitted by the mosquito is a huge area of, of interest because essentially what we do at the moment is we treat people who have malaria and it you know, makes them well, uh, but that does not stop those same people transmitting that malaria parasite to someone else. So you're, you're treating and you're affecting the individual person, but you're not affecting the spread. So there's a lot of work now in, in either drugs or vaccines or other approaches to stop the transmission of parasites from people to mosquitoes. Um, and there are lots of different ideas. Uh, lots of them look good in, in, a, in a lab setting with a parasite strain that was isolated in the Netherlands. You know, which of those will then roll out and have an impact? It, it's to be seen. But that idea of stopping the spread from people to mosquitoes is a huge area of work and something we can't stop at the moment. So a brief final question. Uh, I'm Ian Hughes. I'm a pediatrician here in Cambridge. Uh, I'm not going to let you off the hook. I'm coming back to the question that my co colleague next door to me asked. And it's a variant of that. Okay, so you say they can do it for $20 or whatever. Um, and the whole population you think in the UK will eventually be sequenced. Actually, the samples for that are available for you right now mm -hmm. because every individual born in this country and in many other countries has a blood sample collected at birth. Mm -hmm. So if you had that resource, and when would you, when would you release the data on that individual? So I, I should, I, I've clearly positioned myself wrongly as an, ad, <laughs> as an advocate for whole genome sequencing in the whole population. I, to, to clarify, I'm, I'm pointing out that this technology is coming. Um, and it's, it's coming in ways we don't expect. Slightly off the topic, I read an amazing article about polygenic risk scores and educational attainment the other week. And there's actually quite good associations now between extreme phenotypes in educational attainment and polygenic risk scores. And the article made the point that someone will commercialize that quite soon. So there will be commercial companies that people will be able to take a sample of their children's saliva to and get them tested and then go to their school and say, 
look, this company says my child's a genius, what are you going to do about it? I'm not, you know, I'm saying this flippantly, but this is absolutely, I, I think, going to happen. In terms of the, the stored samples and data sharing is absolutely key and data security. We, do, we actually do quite a lot of um, research around this, so social science research, asking people what they would do. So Anna Middleton, who's a, a member of my team, is running, I think, the biggest survey there is about attitudes to DNA data sharing across multiple different countries. She's asked more than 10,000 people within the UK, who would you want your data shared with and, and why? And the general sense is sharing amongst researchers they're quite relaxed about, they get that sharing with pharmaceutical companies they're nervous about because the feeling is that they'll monetize that data. So making people confident that their data is safe is an absolutely key thing. Um, one other last snippet I'll, I'll leave you with. The interest, one of the interesting things to come out of that survey, that when people asked what was their biggest concern about sharing their genomic da data, and they had a drop-down list of about 20 different things, you know, I might not get insurance and so on, the number one risk that people across the survey of 10,000 people rated was someone will take my DNA and plant it at the scene of a crime and I'll be framed from a crime that I, don't, that I didn't commit. So the kind of level of understanding that we've got to overcome is, is huge. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.